guys and welcome to my channel the post-apocalyptic inventor my name is Gerolf I'm from Germany I have uploaded about 150 episodes on this channel here over the course of the last four years and they have been watched about 25 million times up to this point in those videos I mostly presented repair jobs refurbishing old tools but also making electronic gadgets myself also mechanical stuff but all in all it's all been about me and my work so I figured after all that time it's about time that we pay a visit to other people who are doing similar things, talk to them, take a look at their workshops and their work, of course, and interview them. So for that, I'll hop right into my car and we'll drive over to Berlin, Germany's capital, and meet those guys there. Come along. So our little journey starts in Cologne. And in order to get to Berlin, we have to take a ride 600 kilometers to the east. And while we're still in the western part of Germany, we cross the industrial heartland, where it seems that we witness a country that never really sleeps. Where the roaring sound of seemingly never-ending industrial production and industriousness fills the air. But where many others might see nothing else but just annoying traffic jams and commutes, I also hear and feel the heartbeat of a highly industrialized nation and the foundation of Germany's standing in Europe and the world today. And while many seek to come to this country to find a better future, that roaring sound is of course dominated by a technology many say is not the future, but the past. The sound of course of the internal combustion engine, and especially in this country, preferably diesel powered. And rather ironically, my first stop on the road is at a gas station near the city of Hamm in Westphalia. And while filling my tank with gasoline, I take a look at the nearby power plant called Westfalen, a rather failure-prone coal-fired power station that reminds us that even though this country often likes to fancy itself as a pioneer in renewable energies, is still very much relying on burning black coal and lignite to fulfill its energy needs. And just in case you've never heard of it, this is also the very place where Germany's only ever thorium-based power station was once built and operated. After billions spent the THTR 300 thorium high-temperature nuclear reactor was shut down and then later partially demolished back in 88-89 at this very spot. So, no matter if it was for mainly technical or just political reasons, it's safe to say that this is the very spot where Germany's dream of a thorium-based energy infrastructure died. But I'm not here to judge about this or anything else, and not here to make political statements, as I'm making this documentary for a both conservative and liberal audience from all over the world trying to show the reality of a country that is well known by name, yet often misunderstood. So we get back on the road and drive further to the east. And after many more miles through the state of Lower Saxony, we cross the former border between West and East Germany, driving through Saxony, Anhalt and Brandenburg. And we witness the signs of change as we pass one of the many construction sites of the German company Enercon, where it is building one of their gigantic wind turbines. And when you drive on Germany's roads at night these days, you will often find oversized load trucks carrying the heavy components needed in the construction of these giants that are now popping up all over the country. And finally, after a couple of hours, we arrive in Berlin. Just a few centuries ago, nothing but a backwater turned into the garrison town of the warlike kings of Prussia. Then, of course, after World War II, world-renowned as the divided city. Today, a buzzing metropolis, combining old world charm with a promise for a fresh start. And probably today, the number one magnet, not just for Germany's, but Europe's youth, seeking jobs, a future, but also self-fulfillment. But we're not here for the universities, the fancy cafes, or even the tourist spots, we are here for the backyards and those unknown inventors and innovators who call them their home. And the first shop that we're visiting today in a part of town called Tempelhof is that of a small company named Konstruktiv Berlin. And that's a German word for constructive, as you might have guessed, 
And just like its English counterpart, it can mean several things and I think that's very much intended. I spent around an entire week here and with these guys, but I used a rare moment of solitude to explore this otherwise very busy shop. As you can see, there are a multitude of tools here used in both electronics and mechanical engineering projects. We find a crammed electronics corner, but also a 3D printer and different milling machines and bits and pieces of lots of different projects all over the place. It might still very much look like a very dedicated hobbyist workshop, but this stuff here has actually been used for commercial product development for a number of years now. Felix and Tristan, the two founders of this company, have been working together for more than 10 years and about five years ago they founded this little company. Old childhood friends and technology enthusiasts from early on they turned their hobby into a profession and now they develop technical solutions for paying customers. But their personal transition from hobbyists to professionals is hardly easily reproducible and totally intertwined with the spirit of the city. But totally independent of their personal story, it was really cool and really encouraging to see that these two were able to pull this off using many of the same strategies that guys like you and me have been using for years as well. A combination of, well, of course, a lot of know-how, but also lots of open source solutions and really old stuff like used oscilloscopes and DIY power supplies. A 1960s lathe with lots of DIY modifications like a magnetic resolver, a variable frequency drive, and even a self-made CNC cross slide, a self-made CNC router, but of course also endless hours of work and dedication were enough to be commercially successful even in this day and age. But I also have to admit that just an extreme amount of talent is at work here where both mechanical and electronic solutions for rather complicated problems become a reality. But we'll hear more about these two later on in the video and I will interview them. For now we'll check out a bunch of smaller workshops where other lone wolves just like me are going their own way and working on their own thing. So now you guys probably think, gee, these guys must be hard to find. Well, guess what? We're just one door down from Konstruktiv inside the very same building. And here we are at the wondrous world of Tom of Tomsaw. Okay, so I'm in Tom's workshop again and in just a second you'll see some quite ingenious ideas that he has put in place here in order to make um, the best possible use of a very limited space. And see right now he's doing basically some mechanical stuff. He's just working with like a screwdriver and, you know, I don't know, turning some screws. <laughs> but you'll now see how this place will be converted into an electronics workbench in I don't know, maybe a little under a minute or something. So Tom, tell us what you have there and do your thing. Yeah, this is uh, kind of a very common task. You just need to solder one cable also, and you don't want to run around always to another workspace where your soldering stuff is. So I just put the soldering stuff in place and I have my soldering iron over here. And because it's a microchip I want to solder, I have my ESD mattress all under the table. I just put it here. Here comes the cable for the ESD. And the soldering iron is actually heating. It's over here on this little very fuzzy uh, plastic whatever aisle station. But I have all the necessary tools in here. And if I need a uh, microscope too, I can just take it over from here. Whoa. And pull it on. And don't forget your Somewhere. fume extractor, right? Ah, yes, the fume extractor. <laughs> it's over here and it's already running. So. Actually, yeah, it's not perfect. It's a it's an early concept of this, but I'm gonna improve it very soon. And now I'm ready. I can just sit on my chair if it will be here <laughs> and start soldering on this thing in a very professional way. And when I'm done, it takes me another minute to get back to the uh, engineering part of the. Project. It's really cool. So this was just your the the quick conversion between like the two different setups of your workplace. Yeah. You also have lots of other things uh, dangling from the ceiling here. You have like uh, like your 12 volt lamps. They're just running on this uh, beautiful old transformer over there. Yeah. Then you have like a bunch of 
banana jack, uh, like uh, four millimeter cables hanging yeah. from the ceiling, that's your sus, your yeah. usual USB connectors. I also think that's kind of an interesting combination, but I can see where that you know where you can, where <laughs> you come from there. That's power and information. Yeah. Huh? And then you have like these uh, jointed arms here, and what is that? That's a uh, uh, that's a professional photo studio like, yeah. and I once bought it to make pro pack shots for a robot, but then I figured out how useful this is for the daily daily makers, makers like, because it's a zoom lens, so I can light up the whole table if I draw something also, or yeah. if I'm in a more focused thing and I need more light, I can just spot it. And that's so really I can cool. move the spot around also, I can just put it on the, yeah, I can on the jaw. Put it on the jaws of the of the vice. The I vice, think that's yeah. really a really nice cinematic effect, you know. And I yeah. should uh, I should get one of these because for filming, that's really neat. Especially if you want to have like the uh, viewers focus on something. Yeah, <laughs> that's very romantic. It has uh, it's kind of candlelight in a, in the workshop. Yeah. Like. And then of course you have your other miscellaneous stuff here, like another arm with a bunch of wires, and they lead to this lab power supply. But uh, as you might have noticed, there's something quite unusual with the enclosure <laughs> of this uh, bench power supply here. So as I can see, you just basically angled the front panel and then you installed like the rest of the enclosure hanging like on the, on the end of the bench. Just uh, mounted there with uh, ordinary screw clamps. Yes. I mean, some people might not like the idea of... Um, you know, changing the entire setup of, of, uh -huh. a, of a bench uh, power supply like that. But I actually like it. I mean, I, I would never... Uh, I mean, I might have gotten the idea, but I never got that desperate about my working space, I think. <laughs> but this is really cool. Um, I mean, if it's not worth a million bucks, and ma maybe it's even... Maybe you can just uh, put it back, right? You didn't... Did you harm the enclosure or can you just... Um, it was way over the guarantee. I think this thing is <laughs> 10 years old or so. Uh, okay. If I'm true, in the first two years I would not have touched it like that. <laughs> and I just had this... I found it's, it's a super simple hack. It's, it's worth it to get the space instead of keeping the value of some yeah. device that just has to work. Because it yeah. will die in my hands. I don't want to sell it. Yeah. So. One can tell that you... Uh, really have gotten creative when it comes to um, you know finding new purposes for things like for example there's this uh, manual press here but at the same time it acts as a support for the microscope that's really cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah this thing is actually rarely in use so I don't dismiss the, the quick service of the press because if I need it ah, okay. it's complete uh, abilities I need to detach it for sure but as I'm not using it very often, it's a good holder. I don't have, uh, have to store a second thing for this, you know? So this is kind of, or this could be kind of ironic because you're working on one particular project or product for many years, while maybe the really genius stuff is actually that, the whole of stuff that yeah. you built uh, <laughs> around it, you know? Because I think you really have a... <laughs> have a talent for this, you know? Interesting, yeah. So I mean, if you... Uh, it might need some work, so that it like could be maybe a little more tidy or whatever. But if you're used to it, you will find everything you need and have it just handy. So I think that's really great. But of course, Tom's not just working on electronics here. He also has some really beautiful old machinery, like this Deckel milling machine here that was turned from a manual milling machine into a CNC machine. And some of you probably have recognized it already. This machine came from Stefan Gotteswinter and you might have heard of that guy before because he also has a rather popular YouTube channel. So this machine made its way from southern Germany all the way to Berlin. But what is Tom using all this stuff for? Well, let's just ask him. Yeah, uh, yeah welcome in my little world. It's my magic room and I have all my tools here in the reach of my hand and I do things. I do lots of things, but most of this is uh, yeah not mentionable, but this one is. That's my new project. Or my I do it since two years, but I still feel like it is a new project project. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and as you see, it's uh, made of wood, paper and fabrics. And uh, the benefit here is to use the paper for scribing things. Yes, paper. Okay, no so app. this is basically like a fancy combination of a sketchbook 
Yeah. And uh, a pencil case. Exactly. Right. So that's maybe what you. I don't know if you know, guys still know that from school, but back when we went to school, we had a this pencil is, case. This is a pencil, right? by the way. <laughs> just, to, just to have it on. That's have a pencil example. right here. You can put other things in there as well, though, right? You can put tools in there. If you have a small screwdriver, you could put that in there. Exactly. Too, right? Yeah. <laughs> and if it's magnetic, uh, the the case is magnetic too. So, uh, for example, a needle is very useful. I I used to have a needle with some. Uh, string on it. Okay. And I kept it for months. And th I th didn't lose it. And when I had this button loose on my whatever I wear, I, I could attach it again. Okay. So just a simple example of what it's like a tool, like a Swiss knife for little things too. It's paper, pencil, and a Swiss knife for small okay. utilities. Okay. Ah. So this is your your baby, your product. Mm -hmm. um, it has the German name Rollgut. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I were to translate that, I would say that's like, I don't know, maybe rolling good or rollable good. How do you translate this? What's your English name or mm. sort of suggestion for a translation? <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean, really? What does it mean? What does it mean? Or, or better, why had I did I had the guts to use this <laughs> name in the end? <laughs> So you're really, you're really going with rolling gut then? Uh, I think so, a little. I, I, I had the hope that people see uh, the emotional meaning of, uh, of, of having guts. Style, like, okay. I have it in my guts. Uh, okay, I have it in my guts. Yes. Okay, that's cool because, see, um, you're riding a train and you have an idea about something and you're just using your, using your gut feeling to put it yeah. down on paper. Yeah. And so then you roll it. Maybe that's, not, <laughs> maybe that's uh, deeper than I uh, first thought. Okay, so you've been working on this project, on building this workshop, and on building these prototypes here for a couple of years. The product is now actually there. So what will the next steps be? What's going to happen? Will you have? Will you launch a Kickstarter, or what is going to happen? Um, yep, we're going to launch a Kickstarter because it's just perfect for that. So guys, I'll certainly let you know about that Kickstarter once that happens. And just in case you've been wondering about that, no, I don't get money for saying this. Tom is a guy just like me who's been going his own way here for a couple of years and has taught himself most of the skills needed not only to make but to automate the process of making this product. And I also happen to like it in itself because I'm a guy who writes a lot of stuff down just on a piece of ordinary paper and even almost all of the drawings that you have seen in my videos are all hand drawn. So I would certainly like to see this being a success. But I think it's time that we get to the next shop then. So we're now in yet another part of town called Kreuzberg and we're with Max Vogel, a self-employed solar energy expert who's working on some electronics projects, but who's also into wood and metal working and all his ideas somehow have to do with sustainability. And he has also a couple of things that he wants to show us. Yeah, this is like our organic paper bag stand and um, it's dealing with organic waste in the first place and the energy content. So a big problem nowadays is that um, let's say like 95% of all organic waste within Germany gets lost because it does not get into like a um, um, system where you can extract methane out of it. And there's different problems with that thing. In the first, first, in the first place, like there's too much plastic involved because if you have plastic in your organic waste, like the actual digester doesn't like that. It's going to stay closed and does not open up. And uh, secondly. Uh, people like underestimate the value of organic waste and and this is like a solution how you can organize your organic waste at home in a way that you have uh, your paper bag that contains it like within a system of, of a, within a hanging system so when you step on it you can throw it inside and you leave it then it closes again and the, the advantage over like a bin is that a bin would not be able to um, have it clean and like not um, I mean it would not dry inside the bin like the, the organic waste would sort of like start to ferment inside and you would have like this kind of like gooey, smelly juice inside of there that, that does not, that was not nice at all. It was actually the first thing that came to mind when I first saw that online before we got to meet, you, meet each other in person. I thought, wait, wait a minute, my organic waste is always dripping and often also the, actually the actual floor, the bottom is sometimes also falling out. If you keep that too long within like a, a plastic uh, container 
Yeah, no, that's, that's I, a little bit hard for me to explain. Yeah. People don't believe me that this thing won't break. <laughs> yeah. You know, those those paper bags breaking because like they're inside of like a plastic bin, they can't dry, but when they can dry from the outside, they won't break. Yeah. Like this, this specific paper bag, for example, I and mean, you can even like uh, pour water inside like all the time and it won't break at all. But it okay. can also do with like normal paper bag, but it's like the extra security solution. <laughs> uh, like that, it will not break at all. Ah, uh, cool. And that, that's like the main advantage that when you actually like dispose of your organic waste within the city, you don't have to bring up your, your, um, your bucket again. Because like you just like put it out there. You take it with you and you throw it into like the organic waste bin of like the, the house and then you can go to work. You don't have to bring up your bucket again. Okay, you don't have cool. to clean it obviously because like it's uh, it's a paper bag which can be digested too. And then if you if it's also the paper bag you use for shopping, mm. then you don't actually need to buy garbage bags. It's kind of like crazy to buy new products to get rid of actually also new products that you just like use for a second and I mean. Okay, so you also have lots of uh, I guess older prototypes yeah, those in are the workshop that you want to show them. Different materials and you can see like I really like brass because um, like there's a nice saying like where there's muck there's brass. <laughs> okay. And like this is this is brass just like looks fancy and I'm, I mean like usually like organic waste bins just are like dirty and they're gross and and you can see that I'm not really an expert like on soldering brass yet. I'm working on that. <laughs> oh well. But, uh, yeah, I'd like to we'll make get there. some yeah. some brass too because it's just like it's actually a nice idea. I mean, it could. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's an eyesore. I think this is okay. I mean, as you said, typical waste bins are not beautiful as well, so you might as but well it try be this. <laughs> like to be enjoyable. You have it like in a, in a nice spot in your kitchen. It's not something you want to hide so much. Yeah. Same like your uh, your vacuum cleaner. You mostly want to hide it. It's okay, but nice. for now you have settled on using ordinary steel, and you bent that over here, right? Uh, yeah. Well, steel is like the, the cheapest to make the prototypes. It's like 50 cents per meter. Yeah. So you get it really cheap, and like the bending itself is pretty easy too. You just like a, have a device like that that holds it firm, and then there are like different inserts like how you can bend it, and you can set stops, and it's just like this. But the problem is still like you, you need to get if you want to make them by hand, you need to make lots of them and get experience doing that. And and this one isn't like straight too, so like you also have to like bend them in a way that they fit the the actual purpose that they should serve. So okay, it's still like not a standardized process, not a machine at all. It's just like building prototypes and figuring out like the best design that maybe later could be like um, um, produced in larger quantities by somebody else. Okay, cool. So Max's product here must seem rather low tech and that's true of course, but I think it's perfectly reasonable to do that, especially if you build something not just for yourself, but potentially for a lot of people and you want to see that to become a reality. But Max is not just working on this project, but also for example on a solar powered self watering plant but also on improving and repairing old machinery just like me. And he also seems to have a thing for collecting old tools like this Piccolo multi-tool set here, where you have lots of household gadgets all working on one motor. So there is something that Max wants to tell you and now it's in German, but with English subtitles. When you Bock hat, nach Berlin to come and with us here in Kreuzberg in the Hexenküche Sachen zusammen zu schweißen, Seid ihr herzlich willkommen, das wäre sogar sehr, sehr geil, wenn wir ein paar mehr von den Dingern produzieren könnten und damit unsere Freunde, unser Umfeld ein bisschen mehr über Biomüll sprechen können und dann auch einfach eine geilere Art und Weise zu haben, wie man seinen eigenen Biomüll entsorgen kann. But it's time for yet another shop in yet another part of Berlin. And here we are in the shop of the goldsmith and tinkerer Florian Huhoff. And Florian will show us many of the quite extraordinary techniques and tools that are used here in his workshop. And one of the real treats here is that he really brought this ancient craft into the 21st century. One of the really cool things of visiting Florian here in his shop is that we get to see some equipment that we've probably never seen and that is also probably way out of our price range, at least for me that would be true. 
Like for example, here we have the luxury version of a Dremel. It is powered by an electric motor sitting right in the handpiece. It is very light and flexible, but can spin up to 40,000 revolutions per minute. And you have all kinds of interesting modules that you can put on there, like for example, this belt sander here. And here Florian is showing us how he's working on some silver with that motor. And here we can see how Florian is engraving some lines into an old coin with a graver. And you can see that that little coin is well held by that very special vice here that obviously goldsmiths use. I find it really cool. And this, by the way, is what an old fashioned graver looked like back in the day. And here we have the next really interesting tool. It's got an argon bottle and an electrode. What could it be? You guessed it, or maybe not. It's a tick welder. But a tick welder that you have to use a microscope for in order to weld. Kind of crazy, isn't it? But here we see Florian welding two pieces of silver sheets together. And this is what it looks like. And this is what it looks like after polishing the weld. And here, just for a size comparison, this one cent coin. And here Florian is showing us one of his little hacks that he came up with in order to, well, basically automate one of the processes that he has to do very often. And that is making, well, little pieces for positives. This is blue, a special wax that he's working on. And well, he had to put that into a lathe. And you can see that that lathe is partially controlled by a cordless power drill. And he's been getting really good at getting these wax pieces here in just the form that he needs in order to do some CNC machining on them. And so it goes on and on. And what that all is good for is to create a mold so that you can make a beautiful wedding ring. This one here, to be more precise. And making rings is something that Florian is especially good at, obviously. And here is a little gadget that won him a prize a couple of years ago, as he told me. It's a ring with an integrated RFID chip. And you can use that for wireless identification, for example. So all of the guys we just met, I pretty much never met them before and only got to know them while I was on my short one week stay here in Berlin. There were either viewers of mine who had contacted me or friends of the guys from Konstruktiv. So in other words, they just give me some interesting material and I give them a little bit of coverage and I think that's only fair cause I'm a lone wolf and these guys are lone wolves as well and I think it's about time that we guys get together and help each other. So if you want me to visit your town, your place, your shop and show what you're working on, then just contact me under inventordonations at gmail.com and maybe I can plan some more trips to other places. And I'd also be happy to come to Berlin again, meet these guys again, do some corporations and so on and so forth. But there's one more thing that we still have to do. Get back to the guys from the beginning. And I was actually planning to put the interview with the two guys in here, but I think that this video is already long enough. And let me know if you want to hear that entire interview. I will then also upload that here on the channel. But there is another thing. They have a message for you. So you're about five years in with this company. So where do you see yourself a couple of years down the road, like maybe five years in the future? Where do you want to go with this company? Um, I want to go a little bit bigger, but uh, like not, not huge. <laughs> and um, at the moment, yeah, we're really in, in need for embedded programmers. So that's, that's the issue at the moment. Okay. <laughs> um, so we're working with some freelancers, but our hopes are to get like a permanent 
embedded programmer because the subject is something we can't really cover and it's getting like more and more important at the moment. Um, yeah, so I think that would be maybe us. Mm -hmm. Then we just hired one for project management and PCB layout. That's his stuff, and also a bit of help out in the um, yeah in the in the workshop. Um, so that's three permanent at the moment, and then and then um, so I think there could be like an embedded programmer or maybe two. <laughs> And then someone else in CAD, and maybe another one. So we would be like, let's say, eight to twelve in five years. That would be. So. At but you would be interested in people who are into embedded programming right now. Yeah. Also. Yeah. Right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Open-minded in terms of they, they don't just know what is embedded yeah. programming and can do well, stuff, but also know about the electronics behind it and and like like open to both sides what, what they usually have their interfaces with. Okay. Or what last are, month would be the, better than right now. Yeah, okay, I understand. <laughs> so, internet out there, you heard that. You, know, you can reach those guys, uh, contact information below. You know. <laughs> um, so what kind of experiences should that person have? Is there any particular thing, like should well, it should work we, with that? that no, it, it, there's no limitation in terms of like a platform or a language mm -hmm. but it's more like um, sort of to be creative like what solution is best for this specific project so it could be embedded C it could be like an embedded OS um, could be a real-time system could be Arduino and a library to just for a, for a quick hack okay but it would also be cool like if this person could like connect an Arduino to a computer and do some like evaluation of sensor data and could be could do like I don't know a small like really really functional GUI um, just like yeah but that, like in neither of the subjects there it needs to be a specialist okay so so but but this like creativity in tools that's what we're looking for mm -hmm. okay and yeah. knowing how to use an um, yeah oscilloscope and and uh, debugger and having having a tool chain at least in mind or in in the case. Um, what what is needed to be like set up for doing debugging and developing stuff, okay. like this basic yeah. what what we what we do and what it needs to fit in, and, okay. and a little understanding of electronics, okay. so yes. just the basics because we've made experiences that like I don't know people would just connect a battery the wrong way or something, so like yeah so something or like they didn't sort of really have this attitude that also the electronics that we put together was something that we have been working on for two weeks maybe. Okay. And so this would be something to at least understand like some some of electronics would be really helpful. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So that was basically all that I wanted to show you about my little trip to Berlin. And as I mentioned before, I would be very happy to make more trips like this to other places maybe. And well, if you want to show me something and want me to visit you, then don't be shy and send me an email. And also all you guys out there who really like this video, please consider going on patreon.com slash TPAI and become a Patreon supporter of this channel. Now, I won't be lying, this channel will never put out three or four videos a week or something like that. It's more likely that it'll be three or four a month. But, well, I show you guys stuff that you will see nowhere else. And I typically also go really into the details of things, which not a lot of engineering channels here on YouTube do. So I really hope there was something interesting for you guys here then and see you soon.